Okay, so I'm going to start by going back over some elements of Picasso's production in textiles and in ceramics. And so part of what I have to say will touch on topics or even particular ideas or even particular examples uh, from talks we heard yesterday. Um, after that first section, I will then shift to contemporary art and try to show you how some contemporary artists are picking up on these ideas we can find in Picasso. I'm not going to try to figure out were they literally influenced by Picasso, you know, were they looking at his work in particular, but um, as Yeats said of Freud, no, of, never mind. In any case, Picasso has clearly become an atmosphere that we all live in without necessarily needing to be aware of the uh, particular channel of transmission. Okay, if we could go to the first um, slides, please. Oh, wait, I have a clicker. Look at that. So many words. Right, okay. So um, I want to start with some questions that were inspired by reading the books of Nestor Garcia Canclini in preparation for this seminar. Um, the, the image on the right, the unicorn tapestry, a famous tapestry, late medieval tapestry that's now in the cloisters in New York, it, it seems pretty clear that this is elite art. It's highly finished, it would have been very expensive, it's extremely elaborate, it also is full of curved and naturalistic forms. The work on the left is more complicated. It's not so obvious how to evaluate it. Um, it's a wari, it's a tapestry from a culture known as the Wari from um, Lima, Peru, dating to around 500 AD. It's one of those rare examples of very old textiles. Uh, and this is the sort of tapestry that has been of great interest to students of modernism. There was an exhibition of this kind of work at the Museum of Modern Art in the 1930s. Um, people saw these geometric forms as an antecedent to geometric abstraction in modern art. But the question I want to raise is, should we consider this a folk art or an elite art? I think there is a tendency to think of something that at first glance is simpler and more geometric as being closer to a folk art requiring craftsmanship that's not as elaborate uh, and to draw an antithesis. And this is an antithesis that has come back, I think, throughout our many of the presentations yesterday, and I imagine will come back today, between the folk, folk art or the popular and um, elite art. And of course, the interest, the, the general theme of our seminar yesterday and today is to look at this tension within the work of Picasso. But I want to question that idea that this kind of geometric tapestry is in fact a folk art. Uh, first of all, I'm not even sure that it should be considered abstract. When you start digging into the imagery of this kind of textile, it very often turns out that the geometric forms have figurative meaning, that they are stylized versions of figurative images. Secondly, a tapestry this elaborate, this beautifully made, was probably an elite object in its own society. Uh, we might draw a parallel here to kente cloth in Africa, which was, um, you know, has now become a symbol, at least in my country, of African American identity and is seen as a revindication of the popular, but in fact, in Africa, where it was originally made, was a cloth for the elite. It was a royal cloth. Not everyone could have it. Not everyone was allowed to wear it. So my general point here is that crafts do not necessarily fall into the realm of the popular. OK, let's go to Picasso himself. Uh, so here on the left is a collage of 1913, and on the right, a tapestry based on a design that he made um, in 1934. Now, the collage includes a piece of wallpaper, uh, which you can see the elaborate floral motifs. They're a little hard to read because they're dark and brown, and they've probably gotten darker since he made them, uh, since he made this collage. 
Uh, but this kind of wallpaper, although it is paper, it's printed paper, was generally a cheap substitute for textiles. If you had the money, you would buy beautifully woven or printed fabrics to put on your wall. If you couldn't afford that, you would buy printed wallpapers. There is a whole fascinating history here that goes back to the 18th and 19th centuries of the evolution of printed wallpaper as a substitute for fabric. Uh, but my point is really that Picasso was fascinated by these fabric-like patterns, Picasso and Brock, uh, and that he put these fabric patterns, little swatches of them into his cubist work beginning in 1912 and 13. Now here on the right is this much more elaborate tapestry. I mean, this is, the whole thing is a tapestry. There is a painted uh, maquette for this. Uh, but you can see that in the tapestry, Picasso has carefully had them reproduce a, a similar piece of elaborate floral fabric. So it's in effect the textile reproducing a different kind of textile so that there's a collage element here. So this uh, interest in fabrics then was not merely something that popped up in his work in 1912, 13 and then went away. It's something that endures throughout much of his career. Um, to go to the next example, here on the left is one of Dora Maar's photographs of um, Guernica in progress. And if you look over at the right side, let's see, no, not a laser pointer. Um, if you look over at the right side, you can see that the woman at lower right has a piece of fabric attached to her body. Picasso, in fact, experimented with adding fabric to Guernica. There's a floral fabric on her body. There's fabric on the mother at the far left. There's also, though it's harder to make out, a striped fabric on the body of the woman who is, is falling at upper right. So that he thought about adding fabrics to Guernica and then he decided not to. It, he went back to the original conception of the painting as being black, white, and gray. Although my recollection is that he actually did modify the falling woman, that he drew in stripes similar to those in the fabric, although he took the fabric away. Now, as you can see from the photograph on the right, and here I'm picking up on a point that Kay Wells made yesterday, um, in the same studio, a few months later, he began work on the maquette for what would become a very elaborate tapestry. This is the work known as Femme à leur toilette. Um, so in effect, I, I think if we put these together, and that's why I've shown these two photographs, you can see him coming up with an idea while he's working on Guernica, thinking, no, this doesn't work for this painting, and then coming back to the same idea. You know, he doesn't want to abandon it. He wants to do something with it in this elaborate work that you see on the right. Now, here is a larger reproduction of that work. And this is, from a technical point of view, really quite extraordinary. Almost every form in this work is cut out from a piece of wallpaper or a piece of fabric. It, it's, it's not a collage like the 1913 one that I showed you earlier, which is mostly abstract forms or drawing in charcoal with a little bit of texture, of textile type collage element. The whole thing is collaged elements. Um, I mean, I have to say, Alas, I don't think this is a great picture. I don't think it's a success, but it is a fascinating work. And one of the things I want to point out, because I think it tells us something about Picasso's psychology, is that the elements themselves are extremely interesting. I've, I've zoomed in, so to speak, on a patch uh, that's here at lower right. If we zoom in on that, here's this you know, strip of colored fabric, a series of colored bands, this itself is a distinctively modern idea. You see something similar in the work by the German artist Gunther Stolzel. This is a wall hanging produced in the Bauhaus weaving workshop in the mid-1920s. So Picasso is not prepared, you know, he often said, no, he wasn't interested in being an abstract artist. People in effect said to him, well, you know, your, your work gets so close to abstraction, why don't you just become an abstract artist? And he always refused, he, he needed the, reality like the grain of sand in an oyster that helps make the pearl. 
but he clearly was interested in purely abstract form. So in effect, I, I mean, I don't think he was thinking of Gunther Stolzo when he added this particular element, but he was fascinated by, he clearly loved that procession of colored bands, so he inserts it as an element in the work he's making. Now here I want to repeat something else that Kay well said, uh, which is to look at the difference between the original painted version of the Demoiselle d'Avignon and the uh, tapestry version that Jacqueline de la Baume d'Urbach made with Picasso's acceptance, indeed encouragement that she should modify it. This was a very important point that Kay Wells made yesterday, that he didn't want her to copy it precisely. It, it could have been done, um, and in fact, I mean, there is a tapestry version of this. It's an absolutely faithful re copy. I mean, all the little details are copied. Um, so Picasso, on the contrary, for the Demoiselle and for most, for all of the tapestries that he made with Jacqueline de la Baume d'Urbach, wanted her to remake them, to rethink them for the tapestry medium, not just to reproduce them as if it were a very large photograph. So as Kate Wells pointed out, in the tapestry version, the gradations of color and tone become abrupt transitions, that he goes, she goes from one color to another that is lighter or darker, there are hard edges between them, the smooth modulated shading that you see in the Demoiselle d'Avignon, the 1907 painting, gives way to a series of abrupt transitions. Also, she often introduces hatch marks which I think are inspired in part by the hatch marks in the so-called African faces at the right and upper right of the painting, but she generalizes those. She um, uses them throughout the painting to create intermediate tones. And of course, I should r remind you that this work, the tapestry is in the exhibition here in this museum. So if you haven't already been to the museum to see the exhibition, the installation of the permanent collection, please go see it and look carefully at this tapestry. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. Um, now, this kind of rethinking of what Picasso had originally done is something that also comes up in other art of the 1960s. So we find, for instance, the American artist Roy Lichtenstein taking this composition from a painting <coughs> that was on view in an American museum at the Brooklyn Museum of Art and redoing it with different colors, with hard edge lines, with flatter colors, the sort of misty, somewhat symbolist character of the shading in Picasso's um, 1942 work gives way to something that seems much more pop, much more American, typical of the 1960s, and yet, in a way, those qualities were already there in the tapestry that uh, uh, Picasso did with Jacqueline de la Baume d'Urbach uh, in uh, a few years earlier, in 1958. All right, now I want to shift to the theme of vessels and bodies, to ceramics, and within that, the theme of vessels and bodies. And so, whoops, images. Uh, when Picasso starts working in ceramics, one of the things he does, and here, of course, I'm repeating part of what um, Harold Thiel and Salvador Harrow said yesterday, so I'll, I'll try to move through this rapidly. One of the things he does, uh, as, as, as they showed, is to take existing forms of vessels and to move pieces around, to recombine them in novel, in brilliantly experimental ways, as you see in the work on the center and the right here. Uh, but in doing so, he is also looking back at you know, a major achievement in 20th century art, which of course are the, the various birds of Constantin Brancusi, beginning with Maestra in, in 1910. So the, the large rounded shape indicating the body that we see in solid marble in Brancusi's work returns as hollow ceramic forms in these um, smaller or somewhat smaller images by Picasso, uh, works by Picasso. The difference, of course, is that the Picassos are hollow. And I think there's an interesting question here about the significance of this hollowness. I mean, hollowness is a fact about ceramics. They're hollow. 
as opposed to sculpture, which is solid. But it, it, I think it carries a kind of metaphorical meaning. There's something strange and haunting about that hollowness, which it seems to me Picasso activates as an aesthetic quality. Now, and again, you, you've seen some of these photographs and these points made. There is a difference between, as we heard yesterday, between the, um, the unique works made by Picasso um, using forms and materials from the Medora workshop and the additioned works. Uh, so I'm not going to dwell on this because it was explained much better and in greater depth um, in yesterday's talks. Uh, I do want to mention one point. Let me see. Do I want to go back here? Looking at this row of pots in the middle that are elaborately, you know, that are painted, this shows us the procession of paintings or glazings that bring out a full pot. Some of these additions, uh, there were 600 works made at Madura in editions that ranged from 25 all the way up to 500, according to the catalog Raisonné. Um, a lot of, some of them involved sculptural processes that were akin to printing. Others were simply repainted. Again, I'm, I'm repeating what you heard yesterday. Uh, there's a wonderful quotation um, in a catalog by Marilyn McCulley and her husband Michael Rayburn of the Attenborough Collection. They quote a Turkish artist named Abedin Dino who worked in, in this workshop at Madura, and he describes Suzanne Ramier, the, one of the founders of this atelier, copying one of Picasso's painted designs, and he says, miraculously, almost without looking, without seeing, she is Picasso when she is copying him. Picasso watches her doing it, stunned. He sees himself working. So there's something fascinating going on psychologically in this relationship. Um, it, you know, this would get us off into other territory. So what I wanted to turn to next is the question of the body, the hollow body, how does the human body relate to the form of a vase or a pot? Um, in the work on the left, one of Picasso's earliest works in this medium, he is taking the given form of a vase and painting it so that it is fully identified with the body. In the work on the right, and as you can see, there are two versions here. There's a unique work in the center, and then there's an additioned work on the right, which is very, very similar, uh, but not quite exactly the same. There are some tiny differences. Um, in these, interestingly enough, he uses the vase as a kind of pictorial field, but then he puts a body in it in a way so that you can see the correspondence between the body and the larger shape of the vase. So that the woman's arms and her torso and her breasts spreading out like this correspond to the indented upside down triangle of the upper part of the vase, whereas her hips and her rear end and so forth, her legs, her thighs swelling below the waist are juxtaposed onto the rounded lower part. So it's not quite that the vase is a body, it's not that it is a body, as in the work at the far left, it's that it evokes a body, or that the body evokes a vase. I think that this, sorry, slight difference between them is, is extremely fascinating. Now, I want to oh, turn to, again, a comparison or something worse we've seen before, the question of the painted surfaces, when Picasso simply used a plate, a more or less standard form, and then used glazes to paint on it. Um, the one on the left seems very simple, but in fact it has a richly textured surface that is hard to see in reproduction. Uh, in the plate on the right, Picasso uses this black glaze for drawing, which, and he, here I, again, this is a point that um, Salvador Harrow and Harold Thiel made yesterday, but I want to underscore it, to emphasize it, that there was in fact something profoundly original about the drawing style that he came to in this work. Now here on the left is the detail from that plate, and notice how he uses these dabs of black. I think you referred to it yesterday as commas, and that's a great description. I wish I had thought of that, but um, they're kind of areas Solid black, you know, normally artists draw a contour with a narrow line and then they fill it in 
what seems miraculous about these works by Picasso is that he creates a kind of splotch or a blot or a dab of black that is simultaneously contour and color so that the, it's the solid thing and also the edge around it. And somehow this all works together to become a bull, a horse, a picador, or smaller versions of those dabs of black become the heads of spectators in the foreground. This seems, this is such a great style that it seems like it must always have been there. The only thing I can think of remotely like this in the history of art is um, the Cozens brothers' studies of clouds and trees in the 19th century, where they do sort of blots of solid tone, gray or brown, with no distinction between contour and fill. Um, maybe there's something else I'm just not remembering, but in fact, I think this is quite a revolutionary style and one that has been often imitated since then. Um, so, so wonderful that we take it for granted. And, and this was a point that was made sort of in passing yesterday, but I want to, you know, reinforce it. Um, Picasso knew he'd achieved something wonderful with these compositions, and he came back to them so that the relationship of the picador and the bull gets repeated in a drawing from 1957, and then it gets repeated again in an aquatint from a year or so later. Um, these things look very casual, but they're not. Um, Picasso was intensely aware. He looked very hard at his own work, and when he, when he saw something that he was excited about, he came back to it over and over. He, he reused compositions and images. So to recap, um, I've been talking about Picasso's engagement with textiles and patterns, his interest in ceramics as volumes, and his interest in ceramics as a, a, a version of painting. Now I want to turn to how does this work in contemporary art? Well, one of the artists, Jose de Rora was speaking recently, a, a few minutes ago, about the uh, Venice Biennale of this summer. One of the artists that I was excited to discover in Venice and then again at Documenta in Kassel is a Polish artist of Roma background named Malgorzata Mirgatas. And here on the right is a panel, a very large panel, from a series she calls Out of Egypt. Now, this was it in Kassel, not in Venice. Um, as you can see, this repeats, I mean, she explains this. You don't have to be a great art historian, she tells us. Um, She's repeating compositions from a series of etchings by the 18, uh, 17th century artist Jacques Callot, uh, which were about the fate of, it's also known as Les Bohemiennes, the fate of what we would now call Roma, or gypsies wandering around on the margins of society. So uh, Mirgatas is going back to this tradition of marginalization, uh, political, social marginalization, picking up on an earlier reference to it or an earlier representation of that experience and reusing it at a much larger scale. I mean, the Jacques Callot is about this big. The tapestry is, is you know, taller, much taller than I am. Um, so she's also, note, doing this in fabric, adding not only color but also the, the texture of, of fabric. And um, just as we were looking earlier at uh, the patches of color and texture in Picasso's collages and in his tapestry of 1934, uh, so too you can see, I've, I've pulled out one detail here in the center, so you can see how this fabric stands forth very prominently as a patch of fabric. It's not just a support for representation. It is very much a pattern in the center of the work at left, and how similar it is to the detail from Picasso's tapestry of, of 1934. Now, I want to point out that this is not the typical way that textiles or tapestries are used in contemporary art. What is more typical, and again, I'm drawing an example from um, this summer's Venice Biennale, uh, the, the work on the right here is done by an artist a Mexican artist, Santiago Borja, in collaboration with a group of weavers known as El Camino de los Altos. And as you can see, 
he's taken strips of fabric that are woven on hand looms, not the great big industrial kind of industrial type of looms you might find at Aubusson or in a modern factory, but very narrow looms that can be used, just a person sitting there with them in his or her hands. And these are the same kind of looms that are in fact used to make, say, kente cloth. And um, so we have geometric patterns. This calls up, I think, you know, the, the, the memory of things like the Wari tapestry that I showed you at, at the beginning of this lecture. This, creates a kind of visual argument for geometric form and narrow, small-scale weaving as a folk art. And I would argue that this is, in fact, the, the work on the right, and this was part of a larger exhibition of collaborations between Mexican artists and artisans, a, fast, a great show. Um, this is attached, I think, to uh, the idea of de colonialism, which, as you know, is a very important idea in contemporary art and contemporary philosophy, which, you know, insofar as it reminds us of the injustices and the exploitation of colonialism is a, you know, very important point, but it is often wrapped up with a certain kind of utopian idea that we should somehow get rid of industrialization, get rid of modernity, and go back to a kind of Garden of Eden state of living in harmony with nature and using primitive weaving and so forth, and somehow life would be much better if we could just go back and do that, at which point I feel, well, this is just hopelessly unrealistic. We'd all starve to death, and you know, life was not actually terribly enjoyable in that state of extreme poverty. Um, this is, in fact, a fantasy, but that would, you know, that's a discussion, that's a panel in its own right. Um, turning to vessels, um, I want to look at ways that the image of the hollow ceramic vessel shows up in contemporary art. So um, once again, I'm choosing examples from Biennales. Uh, in the center, I'm going back to Venice in 2019. This is a work by the really wonderful um, Indian artist Rumana Hussein, where she did a series of sculptures uh, that were made from ceramic vessels which she cut in half or manipulated in different ways. And in the context of India in the 1990s, or indeed India today, these symbolize, I think, a, the split in identity. What does it mean for Hussein as an Indian woman of Muslim background to live in a country where there is an increasing amount of ethnic nationalism, where it's often said at this, you know, in the 1990s, this was rising as a viewpoint. It is now the viewpoint of the Indian government that only Hindus are real Indians. So someone like Rumana Hussein finds herself divided, saying, uh, you know, I, I think of myself as a true Indian who happens to be a Muslim, and yet I'm now being told, you know, part of me is not Indian, part of me is or isn't. Um, so there's a powerful, not only bodily metaphor in the split vase, split ceramic, but also a, a political, uh, emotional allegory here. On the right, a more recent work uh, by a new artist, of unfamiliar to me until this summer, uh, Prak Prabhakar Campbell. Um, this was shown from the Uteran series. This was shown in Berlin. And as you can see, he combines Ceramic spheres, which are sort of abstract images of the body, held together and placed by these iron poles with hyper-realistic feet. I mean, the feet are cast, if I remember correctly, in, in iron. Uh, and then on top of it is a blue cow, and this is the symbol of Malgata, the holy cow, which is often taken as an image of Mother India. Uh, the blue is a symbol for divinity, as you, know, you often see images of Krishna painted blue. Um, so I think that this, I mean, I don't fully understand, honestly do not fully understand the allegory in this work, but it seems to me, again, to have something to do with the contradictory elements of Indian identity today. Uh, and the, uh, you might argue that the ceramic elements are a reference to the continuing folk tradition in Indian art, the, the sense going back to Gandhi that the 
small village somewhere out in the country is the true Indian identity, and that even though many, many Indian people now live in cities, it's a bustling, extremely modern society, uh, somehow those cities are not the real India. The real India is the India of the village. And here is a work, uh, a group of two works by our next speaker. Uh, so somehow I had not realized when I was putting this lecture together, I had forgotten that he was speaking next. So I'm a little embarrassed because I, I feel sure that whatever I have to say about this work, uh, he's going to explain is wrong. But um, these were another you know, outstanding installation at, at the Venice Biennale, one of the things that I was most excited to discover and that has, has stuck in my mind since then. Um, as you can see, these are sculptures made from ceramics. They are larger than life size. They are, they, um, they are very, you know, tremendously impressive. They are somewhere in between human forms and animal forms. So you might say he's picking up on Picasso's idea of the vase as an image of the human body, except that, first of all, these are much bigger than Picasso. Secondly, they are not just human. They also seem to be... Um, animal, and furthermore, um, as you can see from the work on the left, uh, they, they are visibly hollow. There are openings that are displayed in a way that I found, and again, this may just be a mistaken association, made me think of them as being not only ceramics, but something like kilns, as though you might use these sculptures to make ceramics, implying that there's a creative function to them, that they are wombs or incubators for creation as well as looking like living creatures themselves. Um, and there's also, you know, something kind of charming and witty and, and childlike and wonderfully seductive about the form language here. So, um, you know, obviously uh, ceramics of this type are very much alive and well in contemporary art. And then finally, I want to come back to this theme of painted surfaces. And um, this is not so typical in perhaps in very contemporary ceramics. The, it, the comparison that came to mind was between what Picasso did and an American artist uh, who achieved fame when she was very old, I think she died recently, uh, named Betty Woodman, a really wonderful artist. This is a work of hers named The Portuguese in Japan. As you can see, it's a series of vessels with kind of fins at either side that are painted in two different sets of colors. So the brownish set of colors on one side and blue on the other, although this is the same work. Uh, what strikes me is that she's using glaze in a casual, spontaneous way with sort of splotches, blots, dabs of color, not tightly controlled um, in a way that is somewhat similar to what Picasso is doing, but that there's also an exciting relationship between the way she draws with glazes on the ceramics and the form, say, of the fins themselves, that she, in effect, is taking that graphic kind of draftsmanship and extending it to the physical object. So there's a, a sort of feedback loop between the way she draws and the way she sculpts or the way she, she crafts in ceramic. And then the last artist I wanted to discuss is a wonderful Korean artist named Yi suk Young, um, who was at the 2017 Biennale. And I'm sorry, these photographs are a little dark. I mean, as you can see, much of this lecture is based on photographs I took with my phone, which now seems to be the, you know, the way we do contemporary art history today is to walk around with the telephone taking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of photos, which is fun. Um, so this is a very large work by Yi Su Kyung. She started called, I love this title, Translated Vase, Nine Dragons in Wonderland. Nine Dragons in Wonderland, yes. Um, as you can see, she uses traditional celadon porcelain, which is very much a, a, a signifier of identity for Korea. I mean, celadon also is found in Chinese porcelain, but it's, it's associated particularly with Korea historically. She uses this as a raw material, but then she breaks vases and reassembles them into abstract sculptures that are 
reminiscent of the human body. That's why I've made the comparison to the Picasso on the left, but not exactly like a body. So in effect, she's combining his collages of 1912-13 with their breakup of form with his ceramics of 1949-50. But I'd like to zoom in on the detail, which are the places where she's broken the vases and then recombined them. And when she glues them together, as you can see, they have these seams that are then highlighted with gold, with, with gilt or gold paint. This is a Japanese technique known as kintsugi. Um, so the kintsugi is associated with a Japanese aesthetic known as wabi-sabi, which is valuing the effects of age and time and wear and tear as opposed to merely formal perfection. There are all sorts of you know, cute little Japanese parables about wabi-sabi versus traditional beauty. But I want to draw a, a somewhat perhaps far-fetched comparison here that I'll end with which is between the practice of Kintsugi in Yi Suk Jung's work and uh, the Kabbalistic idea of Tikkun Olam, and this was suggested by the, the, to me by the gold seams. Um, so as you know, Kabbalah is essentially a 17th century a Jewish idea uh, associated with Gnosticism. I mean, it goes back beyond that, but it really takes off in the 17th century. And in the cosmology of the Kabbalah, Adam, God creates the first man, Adam Kadman, and infuses his body with divine energy. So this is a version of the Adam story in the Bible. But that first, God was not in fact such a great craftsman, it turns out, because the body, and I, you know, we have to think of Adam being made from clay, as it says in the Bible, the, this clay body was not strong enough to contain all of that divine energy. So, Adam Kadman's body shattered, and the divine energy within it was spread throughout the vastness, the emptiness of the universe. This is the kind of Kabbalistic idea of early cosmology, perhaps you might say the Big Bang of, Cosmo of, of Kabbalah. Uh, so what we have then instead of the perfectly divine Adam is a world of mixed good and evil. The, the sparks of divinity have been spread throughout the universe and mixed with mere ordinary matter, uh, you know, lost or corrupted by this mixture. So according to the Kabbalah, it is in fact a sacred duty. I mean, if, since it's the Kabbalah, it's a sacred duty for Jews, but I'd say it's a sacred duty for all of us to retrieve these lost sparks. Um, in this process known as tikkun olam, retrieving the sparks. Note that this is not about making a revolution. This is not an apocalyptic theme that, you know, time will come to an end and there'll be a great battle and then there'll be a perfect society afterwards. That whole idea of the end of time, the last judgment, the final battle is something that in fact emerges in Jewish texts before the invention of Christianity and then gets taken over into the book of Revelation. But this is completely different. I mean, this is basically, you might say, reform rather than revolution. This is about trying to fix the universe by many small acts of goodness, doing what you can in individual places and times to retrieve goodness, to, to, to get those divine sparks back together. And for me, rightly or wrongly, Yi Suk Young's sculpture seems like a, a vision of that idea. Things have been shattered and yet they are being brought back together and these gold seams read to me as those um, sparks of divinity. So let me remind you that Picasso once described his own work as a sum of destructions. Um, and there's many obvious ways in which that's true but it seems to me that in each case, that act of destruction in Picasso is followed by an act of creation. And we find this divine spark, so to speak, the divine spark of creativity that appears in the sequence, in the sequel to each act of destruction. Thank you. <laughs>